Here we are in Idaho's Big Wood River Valley between the Smoky Mountains and the Pioneer Mountains in front of Ernest Hemingway's final residence. Ernest Hemingway first came to Idaho in September of 1939 upon the invitation of Union Pacific and the new Sun Valley Resort as part of their publicity plan. It was in 1959 that he and Mary purchased this house to make their final home. Mary bequeathed the house to the Nature Conservancy after her death in 1986. The Nature Conservancy gifted the house to the community library in 2017. As significant as the house, we think, is the landscape in which it is embedded. Because as Hemingway returned to the central Idaho landscape for over 20 years, it was the mountains, the high desert, the rivers that he returned to. The house sits on more than 12 acres and is a significant natural habitat and the biggest stretch of protected Red River in the Ketchum area. In the library stewardship of the house, we think a lot about how to honor it with a sense of reverence and respect. Hemingway came to Idaho, we believe, seeking sanctuary. Here he could be a bit out of the limelight, enjoy the things he loved to do with friends that he called the family. The house is a deeply significant historic object. It is the site of his death, and it is where Mary continued to take refuge and find a sense of community and belonging for the remainder of her life. So we honor a sense of privacy around the house. We treat it as a private home and want it to be a place of ongoing creative work and contemplation. This house was built in 1953 by Bob Topping, who was from a tin fortune, and he built it in the style of Sun Valley Lodge. It's exactly the same construction. It's cast concrete from wood forms. It's been stained so you can see the grain. This house has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places in 2015 by the Nature Conservancy. It is uh, listed not only for being the final home of the iconic American writer, Ernest Hemingway, but it's also a great example in central Idaho of mid-century modern architecture. Here we stand at the main entrance to the house, and it was on the morning of July 2nd in 1961, shortly after Ernest and Mary had um, arrived from their long drive back from the Mayo Clinic where Ernest had so recently been hospitalized. And early on the morning of July 2nd, Ernest Hemingway arose. He went and got a gun from the gun cabinet and he came here to the entrance and he shot himself. After that traumatic incident, Mary did not leave this house, but she wrote in her memoir that she had more friends per square mile in Idaho than anywhere else on the planet. And rather than leave, she seemed to settle in even more deeply. After burying Hemingway in the cemetery just over the river from here, she stopped using this as the main entrance to the house. What had been a driveway, she covered over with a lawn, and that is where she held parties on the anniversary of Hemingway's birthday each July 21st. And it was a big community celebration with food and music and storytelling. Here remain some cases that are attributed to Bob Topping's original ownership of the house. These cases contain some of the first scuba diving tanks that would have been developed, and they are addressed to Bob Topping from Cousteau, from Jacques Cousteau. Also, inside where we have these little projector stands, you see the windows here that are directed toward the screen at the other end of the long living room. There are film canisters. The films are no longer here, but the film canisters also are from Bob Topping's time in the house. The living room of the Hemingway house is really a global space, a global room that includes artifacts from different times, different points in Ernest's life. 
in Mary's life and in the original owner of the house, Bob Topping's life. The house was constructed really to be a social space and Ernest and Mary, when they became the owners of the house, um, they certainly continued on with that intent. This was a lively space, and from historic photographs, we see them entertaining around Christmas, having friends around a big table full of food, walking around with beverages in hand, and really having a time of camaraderie and um, social gathering here. Again, you can see artifacts from different aspects of Hemingway's life in this room, the different geographies in which he lived and visited, and different activities that were important to him. There are a number of taxidermied animals from the remnants from his safaris in Africa. There's a kudu and an impala head mounted above the fireplace. And then from forays, hunting expeditions closer to home, um, there is a pheasant and a cinnamon teal that are mounted here. When Ernest and Mary bought the house, they bought it fully furnished. And so most of the furnishings that you see in this room are not only the ones that they lived with, but they are the ones that Bob Topping very deliberately selected for the house, wanting it to be of the moment, very modern, very contemporary for that mid-century time when the house was built. You can imagine Ernest sitting on the couch there. Um, some individuals still living in Ketchum today recall being small boys and sitting on that sofa with Ernest and watching boxing matches on this television set here. One very small piece of ephemera that we find really endearing is um, this little piece of paper that's taped above the television set that lists three television channels. So a cheat sheet to determine what channel is what. And above the television here is the remote control. What would have sat out on the coffee table, we imagine, and they could have adjusted the television um, from there. So from the movie screen to the television screen, this was a space for contemporary entertaining. We marvel at um, the way the original um, owner, Bob Topping, built the house as a state-of-the-art house and and put a lot of money into um, a lot of the details. Lots of the furnishings are built in, like the TV and the bookshelves. This isn't the original Fleetwood. Mary had to replace it. Ernest had a habit, uh, wherever he traveled, he ordered books. So he would make an order every month. Two of the books that are pretty special um, were given to him uh, by friends that he met in Paris. One is called Streets in the Moon, and it's uh, uh, by Archie McLeish, who um, he became friends with in Paris. This book is from 1926, and uh, I am not wearing gloves when I am pulling this book out of its case. We don't wear gloves because it can harm the pages. On the front page, He's written a poem for Ernest, and so we um, are enamored with this book as it is an emblem of friendship and you know, camaraderie as writers. This is the second book that he brought with him that is also published in 1926. So this is the same year that um, Ernest published The Sun Also Rises, and this is Thornton Wilder's first novel, The Kabbalah. He writes, Dear Ernest, Having boasted all my life that the good opinion of others was not necessary to me, I find that leaving this for you, one of my generation, and one I admire, shows me up. Thornton W., October 20th, 1926, Paris. The kitchen, when it was constructed in the 1950s, was really built to be a state-of-the-art modern kitchen. And we see this in the appliances that are here, from the refrigerator to two ovens to an expansive stovetop um, and built-in grilling surfaces. Um, the size of the kitchen, the fact that there is a hearth right in the kitchen makes it a significant and also modern space in the house. 
Mary and Ernest really enjoyed dinner parties. Mary herself was known for cooking and cooking wild game that they had acquired from their own hunts. We know that the first Christmas that they were here, they did have a woman who traveled with them from Cuba, Lola Richards, who provided help for them and probably helped in the kitchen and in preparing that, that Christmas meal as well. And there's evidence of that in notes that Mary had taped around the house to the cupboard. So for example, this note here is one that was taped to a cupboard and ultimately fell off. It's from a friend named Spin who was complimenting Mary for her sweet and sour Turk casserole and thanking her for a, a lovely evening together. There are a couple of ice chests and coolers. Um, we have photographs of Ernest and Mary picnicking down at Silver Creek or up at Trail Creek. And so we imagine these ice chests and coolers going with them um, on those adventures. This ice chest is from Cuba and uh, we like to imagine uh, that it spent many a trip on the Pilar, uh, deep sea fishing, holding cold beverages. It says, Tome Coca-Cola Bien Fria. And that means drink Coca-Cola good and cold. These tiles, we believe they added um, from Spain above the stove top here. Waldo Pierce was a good friend of Ernest's from the early Paris days. That's where they met and they remained friends throughout their lives. This is a birthday present for Ernest in 1959 when Ernest and Mary went through Arizona to visit Waldo. Here we are perched above the Big Wood River with very expansive views over the cottonwood trees and across to the Pioneer Mountains. In this room we see a few different features that tie to Hemingway's time in Cuba and his travels around the world as well as the kind of activities that he did here in Idaho. So one really prominent feature is the desk. The desk, we believe, was brought here from Cuba, one of the few pieces of furniture that they were able to bring from the Finca Vigia to Ketchum. We think it was primarily Mary's writing desk. We have photographs of her sitting at it, but surely Hemingway would have sat at it as well. It bears an emblem that represents different landscapes that were important to Ernest Hemingway throughout his life. And the various trunks and suitcases that remain in the house, to me, are some of the most evocative of Hemingway and the large and peripatetic life that he lived. You can see his name scrawled across the trunk. You can see the remnants of different stickers from the places that he traveled. The dents, the scratches, you really get a sense of um, this was a man that moved around the world. You can also get a sense of that in um, a couple of the pairs of shoes that remain in the house some high boots and some fishing shoes, fishing shoes that would have been much more appropriate to um, his time in Cuba than here in Idaho. Here in Idaho, really his passion was upland bird hunting, much more than fishing. But in this room, you know, we keep in mind that Mary inhabited this house for 25 years after Hemingway's death. And so we really feel a strong sense of Mary's influence here. And that is evident in things that are taped on the wardrobe, um, next to the mirror, in the bathroom, and also in items that are in the closets here. There are a lot of Mary's clothes that remain in this house, and they range from elegant, very stylish, high fashion dresses from New York City and places around the world to a very worn, rugged jacket that she wore when she was bird hunting here in Idaho. Also in this room, we see a number of posters from bullfights, and there are photographs in this room beneath the glass at the desk. He did bring the Matador Antonio and Ordonez to this house. So he had a short visit here. You also see taped to the wall in this room, 
um, a large reproduction of a painting by Cezanne. And the more that we have studied them, the more we see them as pretty deliberate um, tributes to Hemingway and as more poignant items than their casual mounting might imply. Hemingway specifically wrote that he wanted to write like Cezanne painted. So whether Mary put that painting up after his death or had put it up prior to that as a sort of inspiration for him, she kept it up and that tape still holds all these decades later. There's another example of a reproduction that is taped up in a little nook in the bathroom. So again, seemingly very casual, but this reproduction is of a painting by Moreau, The Farm. And this was the first piece of artwork that Hemingway actually purchased himself upon the urging of Gertrude Stein when he was um, in those early days in Paris in the 20s. That painting went through various family disputes. It now resides in the National Gallery. The real original painting was never in this house, uh, but it seems very significant that it would be hearkened here. So that gallery seems very sweet and very touching to me and to I think all of us at the library as we contemplate the many stories that this house tells. This is the secondary bedroom upstairs and we think that it may have been the bedroom that Ernest primarily kept because we think that he and Mary kept separate rooms and certainly he got up early to write. We can imagine him perhaps standing at this window where this typewriter is now looking out beyond the Pioneer Mountains across to the Boulder Mountains where today a portion of the Boulder White Cloud Wilderness bears his name, the Hemingway Wilderness. We do know that because of back problems, he did a lot of his writing standing up. So we can imagine him looking off into the distance and working on a movable feast in this room. We see here other evidences of his travels, another traveling trunk, um, a smaller traveling case, a leather case that was made in Cienfuegos in Cuba. It has his initials embossed on it, and then the identifying tag has it addressed to him in care of Scribner's in New York, his publishing house. Also in this room, we have just recently discovered um, on one of the bookshelves a collection of road maps. These maps illustrate a trip from Minnesota to Idaho and the dates on the maps, the terrain that they cover suggest to us that in that final road trip that Ernest Hemingway took at the end of June in 1961 from the Mayo Clinic back to Idaho, these were the maps that accompanied him and his friend George Brown and Mary on that road trip home. So we're standing in a transformed garage space. So this is not a primary historic space. Mary herself had transformed this space pretty significantly. We want to remember it as Hemingway knew it, as a garage, and also use this space to catalyze future creative work. We think that the best way that we can honor Hemingway's legacy in Idaho is to create an allowance of time in a beautiful space and a supportive environment for current day writers to generate creative work. So we have initiated a writer in residency program where a writer can come and stay in this space for weeks at a time. This is a part of our broader Hemingway Legacy Initiative that has three primary components. In addition to the Writer in Residency program, we are making an effort toward educational outreach um, to help school children and adults, amateur researchers and professional academic scholars to delve into both Hemingway's history and our local history. And the third component of our Hemingway Legacy Initiative is historic preservation. So continuing our research of and understanding of the house as a historic artifact and the many materials that it contains. Since the inception of the Writer in Residency program, we have had um, at least a dozen different writers stay here for different lengths of time. 
So many writers express how they have been deeply influenced by Hemingway's work. And whether or not they consider themselves to work in the same vein as Hemingway, they feel like they have to grapple with his legacy. And he certainly influenced writers in his own lifetime, mentoring some, competing with others, and uh, exerts that influence even today. So for us to offer this beautiful environment, removed from a lot of the distractions of the world, and literally sheltered by the spirit of Ernest Hemingway is a remarkable gift that we think we can offer to our contemporary storytellers. And we need a lot of great, meaningful stories today to help us wrestle with the human experience. Mary Hemingway said that she wanted this house preserved as a nature reference library. And we think that by having writers work here, artists work here, and generate new creative pieces here, we are growing the library that she envisioned.